Hi, my name is Todd Horton. I'm here to talk about how survey grade GPS works. GPS, we said in the previous video, measures distance using radio signals. Those signals have to travel from the satellite to your receiver. As we said, the satellite is a transmitter and your GPS unit on the ground is a GPS receiver. Well, the radio information that we receive comes these days on three transmission frequencies. Older GPS equipment may not be able to receive data on all three frequencies, but perhaps just the first two. It's important to understand that accuracy improves as more frequencies are added. Just in 2013 and 2014, the L5 frequency, as you see listed here, has just come online. On top of the frequencies, we have transmission codes. The two that are most commonly heard of are the P code, or precision code, and the CA code, the course acquisition code. There are other encrypted and secure codes for military use that civilians do not have access to. I want you to think of the code as the music that your favorite radio station broadcasts. It is data that rides atop the basic transmission frequency of your favorite radio station. Well, rather than talk at length about the frequencies and codes, I really want to talk about the data that we get through those frequencies and codes. And the raw data we receive contains several pieces of information, and the two I'd like to spend some time talking about are timing data that we use for clock synchronization, and then this thing we call the ephemeris. Now the ephemeris is a fancy term that we more commonly describe with the word almanac. And an almanac is a prediction, isn't it? Well, the ephemeris predicts the satellite orbit parameters so that we can calculate the position and the velocity of the satellite at any instant in its orbit. This is very important. This tells us where the satellite is at any instant in time. Thus, we know the satellite's positions very well. We measure the distance or the range to each satellite by determining the travel time from the satellite and multiplying that by the speed of light. So the speed of light is the same as the speed of radio signals. Our challenge then is to figure out how long it takes the signal to get from the satellite to the receiver where you are on the Earth's surface. Once we know that distance for multiple satellites, we have effectively measured these, these ranges or these distances. And each one of these satellites has a known position. So when we, uh, when we calculate the intersection of all of those vectors from known points at an unknown point, we can call that mathematical solution a resection. Well, let's consider what happens if we were only using one satellite. You see, when we get a distance from the satellite, that doesn't tell us much other than we are somewhere on a sphere of that radius R1, that R1 radius being the distance back to that satellite. Well, we would like a little better information than that, so we have to use multiple satellites. Well, if we only use two, the intersection of two spheres is going to give us a circle. 
Well, that narrows it down some, but we still need better positioning than that. Three spheres, that is three radii, that is three distances to three separate satellites, those three spheres will intersect at two points. And then if we add a fourth sphere that is indicating another satellite, then those will intersect at one point. Well, consider how far away that is at 12,500 miles. How long does it take to get there? Well, 12,500 miles divided by the speed of light in terms of miles per second will give us a result of somewhere around seven hundredths of a second. Well, that's a pretty small fraction. And if we don't measure that time very well, we can have a great deal of error. What happens when we have some error? Well, this would be, let's see, there's tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands, a million. This would be one ten millionth of a second of error. A ten millionth of a second and timing error would produce a 98 foot error on the ground. Or another way of saying that is the coordinate we have really represents the, the middle of some 98 foot diameter circle. And all we know is the receiver is somewhere inside that circle. Well, for some things that may be adequate, but for survey grade work that is not an acceptable accuracy that we can use for engineering and surveying and mapping work. Our challenge is clock synchronization here. There's two components to this. First of all, the satellite clock, they're actually all the satellite clocks are synchronized together, but uh, any satellite clock and your receiver clock are not synchronized. That is, they weren't started at the same time. Second, the receiver clocks are not near as accurate as the satellite clocks. You see, every satellite clock is an atomic clock, and our atomic clocks will divide time down into about a nine billionth of a second. Well, your, your receiver clock cannot divide time that finely. So let me help you understand how clock synchronization works. Each satellite has a unique what we call pseudo-random noise code or PRN code. Each one has its own unique code. I want you to think of this like a song. And this song is also known in the memory of your receiver. I want to tell you a story to help make this clear. I want you to imagine you have turned on the radio to your favorite station and you hear your favorite song played on the radio. Because it's your favorite song, within just a few notes you know exactly where in the song you are and you know the remainder of the words uh, for the whole song. You synchronize the clock of your mind with the clock of the radio station using the song broadcast by the radio station. Now consider this. The song broadcast by the satellite is, as we say, pseudo-random noise. That is, it sounds like static. And it is a sequence of data that is appears to be random. And it does not repeat for an entire week. This is a very long data stream your receiver has that in its memory. Well, once it recognizes that data stream coming from a particular satellite, it takes numerically that, that stored memory version of that song and it slides it back and forth in time until the song in the receiver's memory matches up with the song being received from the satellites. And all the satellite clocks are synchronized together. So once your receiver clock synchronizes with the satellite clocks, then we can start to measure distance 
This is an important part of the wake-up procedure with your receiver. Once that clock synchronization is complete, your receiver can compute its position relative to all those satellites. We know where the satellites are relative to the Earth mass center, and now we can calculate the distance from the satellites to the receiver because now your receiver clock is synchronized with the satellite clocks. GNSS measures distances using radio signals that travel at the speed of light. Our challenge is to time the travel. Second, GNSS positioning requires signals from at least four satellites. If we only had one satellite, all we'd know is a distance away from the satellite. We're looking for the intersection of the distances from known points. And your receiver clock has to synchronize with the satellite clocks in order to measure the distance accurately.